We well know that around 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ walked through the land of Israel. He came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, and yet in his love for his friends, he laid down his life. And yet his father would not allow his holy one to see corruption, and God raised his son from the dead. And after 40 days, he went to the region of the mount called Olivet, and there he ascended into heaven. And now we also know the Lord Jesus Christ, currently at the right hand of the Father, will return to the earth. He will come back, and if we have died before that time, we will be woken as if it were from a deep sleep, or if we are alive and remain, we will be taken, caught off, we will leave everything behind, and we will be taken, it seems, to the sands of Sinai. Now this is a reality for us that soon we are to be judged. And yet, if we are considered faithful, then when that time of judgment comes, in God's great mercy, we will be blessed with immortal life, clothed upon with immortality. We shall there rejoice together, seeing our brothers and sisters in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will meet all those faithful of old whom you have read about, but not yet personally met. And presumably, while still in Sinai, we'll prepare for the work before us, the great work of assisting the Lord Jesus Christ in judging the earth in righteousness, in re-establishing the kingdom, giving the kingdom back to Israel, that is, establishing the kingdom of God. And so we shall go forth from Sinai to Jerusalem. On the way there, we will have work to do. But our chapter tonight concerns more when we reach the land. So it seems that we will approach the land from the east. We will go up the eastern side of the Jordan River. And like Israel of old, cross over the Jordan River into the promised land. And we will already know what is going to meet us there after we cross the banks of Jordan. We will already know that we are going to find a nation that has been devastated by war, an invader having come down from the north, swept down like a storm. It seems at this point will have cut off two-thirds of Israel. Israel will have been brought to their knees, like their forefather Jacob of old. Jacob, who found himself confronted by his brother Esau in Genesis 32, Jacob, who realized that he had no hope in himself. He was utterly hopeless himself. All he could do was pray to the God of Israel. All he could do was, as Hosea says, after clinging onto the angel, he made supplication with tears. And it was at this point he had his name changed from Jacob to Israel. And all those years later, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he prayed to God with strong crying and tears, and to him that was able to save him from death. For the Lord Jesus Christ was a true Israelite, and he was heard in that he feared. And so the whole nation of Israel that are currently living in the land at this point will have been brought to the same point as their forefather Jacob. Whether or not they cry out, they will have been brought to a position in which they are ready to accept their Messiah. And so we hope to go forth with the Lord Jesus Christ as we cross the river, as we come across the land and approach the Mount of Olives. You can see in this picture here, this is the Mount called Olivet. This is looking from the city of Jerusalem. It seems we will approach from the east side, the other side. So the Jews that are still in the city, we know from Zechariah that half the city will have gone into captivity, which implies that half the city will still remain. They will be looking towards Mount of Olives in the same direction we are now. And we hope to approach from the other side of the mount. And when we reach it, the Lord Jesus Christ's feet will once again stand upon the mount called Olivet. And at this time, there will be a tremendous earthquake when the mountain splits in two, a great shaking in the land of Israel, which causes every wall to fall to the ground. Zechariah tells us how half the mountain 
shall be removed towards the north and half of it towards the south. It perhaps will split down here, where the road runs. There's already a bit of a dip, apparently because the mountains already started to go. Whether or not, not, that, whether or not that is the case, I cannot verify. But we know that in this day, the mountain will split. The invader's army will be devastated by the earthquake, by pestilence, by the Jews turning round and fighting back. And even in all this confusion, when they turn upon themselves. And so the nation of Israel shall be saved. They will be ready to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They will be ready to say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And we hope to be there to see the Jews' conversion as they are brought into the new covenant that finally at last, after thousands of years, they accept their God. And God is able to say truly, this is my people. And so this is our topic for this evening. Hopefully our introduction has helped to put this into context for us. That this is part of scripture and therefore it is helpful for us in our learning. This is a prophecy of future things, something of which we hope to have a part in, that we might have a work in this great day, something very relevant for each one of us. And so we're going to be considering that chapter. We're not going to be going through exactly verse by verse, but we're going to be considering the, the chapter by asking four main questions. Our first question is, who is involved? And so we'll zoom into our first section. Then we'll come down and we'll ask, well, why does the battle take place? Why is it that God has ordained it such? Then we'll move on and ask, well, when will this happen? And we'll finish by asking, well, how will it all end? And so, we'll jump straight into our first section of who is involved in this battle. Well, verse 1 says, The word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, It introduces a new prophecy. And verse 2 says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog. Gog, this all-important character. Look how he's described in verse 17. Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel? Prophets, plural. Which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. Clearly a very important man in the purpose of God. And clearly someone who God is very much against. Verse 2 tells the son of man to set his face against Gog. Ezekiel here, being described as the son of man, reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ, who had the same title. Perhaps this is pointing forward and showing us that it is the Lord Jesus Christ who will confront Gog. Perhaps we also see in this that Ezekiel himself will have a part to play in that day having been raised from the dead. So he is told to set his face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Shubal, to prophesy against him. Or alternatively, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Shubal. And we see it again in verse 3, Behold, I am against the Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Shubal. And again in chapter 39 and verse 1, Prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Shubal. So we see very clearly that God is against him. We also see very clearly that he is the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Shubal. And so it seems clear that we are meant to understand what this means. So the Hebrew has here in verse 2, the Hebrew word rosh, which means head, or by implication chief. And so this can be either translated the chief prince, or it can be translated the prince of rosh. And it seems as various parties arguing for either way. And so we will for now go with the assumption that it is the prince of rosh, taking rosh as a name. Now the suggestion is therefore that rosh refers to a people refers to the people of Rosh, or Rus, therefore the Russians. But is this idea consistent? Well, the, su the suggestion goes on to say that therefore Meshach is Moscow and Tubal is Tobolsk, which I think got its name from the river Tobol. And therefore, the idea seems to fit, at least in this verse, for Moscow and Tobolsk, 
are of course in the region of Russia. But does this fit the wider context? Well, verse 15 tells us that Gog comes down from the north parts. Perhaps it should be translated the utmost north. And we look on our map and we see that Russia is north of Israel. And so it seems to fit. But what about the wider context of Bible prophecy? What about our framework of Bible prophecy? We haven't got time to go into it in detail now, but a lot of us are very familiar with Daniel chapter 2, which speaks of Nebuchadnezzar's image, which speaks of Babylon as the head of gold, and the Bab- Babylonians were replaced by the Medes and Persians, replaced by the Greeks, replaced by the Romans. And do we know that the Romans in the image are therefore represented by two legs? Historically speaking, there was an Eastern Roman Empire, a Western Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire seems to have come down into Europe. And the Eastern, well, what happened to that? For we know that the Daniel's image must stand at the latter days. Well, the Eastern Roman Empire had its capital in Constantinople, and yet the Arabs came and kicked out and took the Constantinople and made it Istanbul. And so it seems they fled to Moscow. In fact, the ruler of Moscow was descended from the Eastern Roman Empire. The first one seemed to be okay, but when his grandson came along, he was slightly worried about his title, apparently. And therefore, he was worried about his position being usurped, and so he decided to call himself a Tsar, linking back to the Caesars, for no one else could make the same claim that they were descended from the Eastern Roman Empire. And so we see the Eastern Roman Empire living on in Russia. Moscow has even been called the Third Rome. And so the view that Go comes from Russia does appear to be consistent with the rest of prophecy. And what about our other nations? We haven't got much time to go into it. This uh, map here tries to identify them. I've taken it from Brother Jonathan Bowen. And if you would like a copy, you can get one later. uh, Because he also, on the back, goes through for his evidence for where he locates the nations. Some of them, like Libya, Libya are fairly apparent to us because it hasn't changed much. Similar with Ethiopia. We're perhaps all aware that Iran used to be called Persia. And yet some of them, like Magog, is perhaps not quite so clear. And yet Magog, we have to do a bit more digging. We find out Josephus seems to link them with the Scythians. We find out Herodotus says the Scythians lived from the river Don to the river Danube, which therefore would be Western Russia, which still fits with our ideas, even perhaps up to Germany and Eastern Europe. And so we see this great confederacy of nations, of Russia, of Europe, of Northern Africa, that come against the land of Israel. But who is on the other side? Well, if we look now down into verse 13... We read of Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof. And look what they say to Gog. They say, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take great spoil? So we note carefully, they say, Art thou come? They are already there in the land. And what are they doing in the land? Well, it seems they are trading we are told of the merchants of Tarshish, we are told that Israel has silver and gold, cattle and goods. And so it seems there's another confederacy that tries to put up a bit of resistance, although we know it won't be successful. So who are these nations? Well, Sheba and Dedan seems to be the Gulf states, of course, excluding Iraq. And we propose that Tarshish stands for Britain, and therefore the young lions, as the nations such as New Zealand or Canada or Australia. (coughs) As we uh, perhaps often see this poster, which speaks of the British nation as the old lion, during the war when he called on the young lions, the Commonwealth countries, to come and fight with them. And so similarly, Tarshish, we look around the world around us and we don't see a Tarshish. 
And so we have to do a bit of digging. And so we have to look for the clues. Tarshish occurs many times in scripture. And so we can come up with various clues. So, for example, you read Jonah 1 and verse 3. And Jonah flees to Tarshish. And how does he do this? He does it by going to Joppa. He goes west, which implies to us that Tarshish is a country somewhere west of Israel. Genesis 10 tells us Tarshish descended from Japheth. And Japheth, it seems, ended up inhabiting the region of Europe. Our chapter tells us that Tarshish has merchants. And the phrase, ships of Tarshish, occurs seven times in scripture. Ezekiel 27 seems to tell us that silver, iron, tin, and lead are indigenous to the land of Tarshish. And of course, as we've seen with the young lions, Tarshish must be a colonial power that has some sort of young lions that have come out from it. And so, we look around us and it seems Britain fits perfectly where so many other nations fail. And so it is that Christadelphians for a long time have identified Tarshish with Britain. This is why we have been so excited in the last couple of weeks. For for such a long time we've seen that Tarshish, that Britain, must play a separate role from Europe. For as we saw in the Great Confederacy, Europe was on Russia's side. And yet on the other side of the battle was Tarshish, was Britain. If they're on two separate sides in the battle, then before that battle can take place, these sides must form. And so Christadelphians looked around them, and they said that perhaps Britain will never enter the European Commonwealth, because surely they need to be on separate sides. And at that point, they were wrong, for Britain did enter. And so we've been waiting ever since for that time of separation. <laughs> In the last couple of weeks, we have seen this before our eyes taking place, as the British people voted to leave Europe. As they are in the process over the next couple of years, it seems, they will exit Europe as this separation shall form. Just a week on from the Brexit vote, I saw this in the news, that New Zealand is offering its top trade negotiators for post-Brexit deals. Britain, coming out of the European Union, needs to negotiate new trade deal deals, and yet they haven't got many negotiators. So one of the young lions is there, ready to step in and help them. New Zealand, who I think has already been successful in negotiating deals with other young lions like America, and apparently with also the Gore States, which would point to Sheba and Didam. And so it'll be interesting in the coming days to watch the result of the Brexit vote, to see Britain's new ties, perhaps with the Commonwealth countries and the Gulf States. And also on the other side, to see what will happen to Europe, whether they will be pushed further to, U further to Russia as a result of Britain leaving. And so this is who is involved. Basically, a worldwide battle with these two parties that collide. And of course, as we mentioned early, with the third party, when God intervenes and Christ and the saints arrive to save Israel. But why does this battle take place? Verse 4, God says of Gog, I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armour, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. It is God that is doing this. It is God that is dragging Gog down as if he was a beast with hooks in his jaws. It's interesting if we compare this expression with what we read in Isaiah chapter 30. For in Isaiah 37, we see from verse 21, that Isaiah the prophet is sent to Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, because Hezekiah has just been praying for deliverance because the Assyrians have come down against Jerusalem. And so Hezekiah prays and Isaiah comes to him. And he says, Thus saith Yahweh, God of Israel, whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And then we come down to verse 29 and see what God says against the king of Assyria. Because thy rage against me and thy tumult is come up into mine ears, therefore will I put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips. 
and I will turn thee back by the way which thou camest. And so too, the king of Assyria was bridled and he was turned back. We know in this instance he'd come against Israel and he was turned back to his own land. When the angel, as it says in the end of the chapter, went forth and slew 185,000 Assyrians in one night. This idea of having a bride in the lip seems to be particularly Assyrian language. If we had more time, we could look at King Manasseh, who, if we look carefully, seems to have been dragged away, either with a hook in his nose or his mouth, by the Assyrians. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 26, is speaking of the light of the sun being sevenfold. It's speaking of Yahweh binding up the breach of his people and healing the stroke of their wound. It would appear to be kingdom language. And then it goes on to say, Behold, the name of Yahweh cometh from far, in verse 27, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. The same idea we saw at the end of Ezekiel 38. God is coming in anger. Verse 28, His breath as an overflowing stream shall reach to the midst of the neck. The neck, of course, supports the head, or in Hebrew, the rosh to sift the nations with a sieve of vanity, and there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. So at the time in which Gog has a bridle in his jaw, causing him to err, all the people have described as having a bridle in their jaw, causing them also to err. It goes on in verse 31 to say the vo- that through the voice of Yahweh shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod. And so it seems Gog here is once again spoken about as an individual and here called the Assyrian, which is why we sometimes speak of Gog as the latter day Assyrian. And see, in the history of what happened to Assyria, a type of the future of what will happen to Gog. And so back in Ezekiel chapter 38, we see that Gog is brought down because God is the one dragging him. It's interesting because it specifically says, I will turn thee back. And we compare this with Ezekiel 39 of verse 2, which also says, I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee. Perhaps not the best translation, but it goes on to say, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts. So Gog is turned back from the north parts. We saw the king of Syria, he was turned back from Israel to his own land. The opposite is happening here. Gog's been turned back against Israel. The implication is that he's already come down into Israel. He's going back up north, and God turns him around and brings him back. We're not sure why this might happen. It could be that Gog comes down, and he creates the peace and safety that we read of, and then goes up north, and suddenly turns around and comes back. For in his eyes, he does not realize the God of heaven is doing this. In his eyes, he is coming to take a prey. As it says in verse 10, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them without walls, and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil, and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places now inhabited, and upon the people gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. And so in Gog's eyes, he's coming down to take this spoil, to take this prey. It seems he sees them as easy targets, for they are now dwelling at peace and safety, without walls, without bars, without gates. And they have gotten rich. We see, of course, the nation of Israel back in their land. We see them quite a prosperous nation, exceedingly good in the area of technology. During the economic crisis, they didn't do too badly. Recently, they have found offshore gas, loads of gas. Interestingly enough, it seems, Egypt has found even more gas than Israel. And we know from Daniel 11 that the king of the north, that Gog, when he comes down, will go first to Egypt and then back up to Israel. And so in Gog's mind, he is coming to take a prey. And yet, why is it that God who we know is ultimately in control, orchestrates this whole battle. Why is it we're told so much about the Battle of Armageddon? We have Ezekiel 38 and 39, 
We have Zechariah chapter 14. We have Joel chapter 3. We have the end of Daniel 11. We have Habakkuk chapter 3. We have loads of other prophecies also, which all speak of this same battle. As we already noted in verse 17, Gog is this very important individual. Why is it this battle is so important? Well, God is going to use this to judge his people Israel. And in so judging them, he will prepare them to accept their Messiah. This great work that he has been working with them over the past thousands of years, he will use this to bring the Jews in the land to a state in which they are ready to accept their Messiah. And so it will be used for the conversion of Israel, which will be a great witness to the nations during the thousand years, for they will see that God was able to save his people. And so as they come up to learn of God's law, they too will take comfort and know that if they too become a part of the commonwealth of Israel, they too can be saved. God will also use this to judge those nations which are gathered as it were into a valley that they might be threshed in judgment. And not only this, not just to be judged, but that God might be sanctified in the sight of the nations. As it says in verse 23, Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. This seems to be the way which God has chosen to reveal his Son to the world when he comes in God's glory and is revealed upon the mount called Olivet and saves the Jews. This seems to be the beginning of the outpourings of the judgments that perhaps will last 40 years, and they will end with the destruction of the kingdom of men and the establishment of the kingdom of God. And so this is why the battle is to take place. But when will this happen? So throughout this whole talk, we have been talking as if this is a future battle, and yet we haven't proved it yet, so let's do that now. When we think about this battle, of course it's got to take place at some point after Ezekiel. Now I don't know of any instance in which this has been fulfilled, although of course I'm not going to use my ignorance as a proof for it being future. Interestingly enough, it seems that shortly before the time of Ezekiel, there perhaps was an invasion quite similar to this, when the Scythians, it seems, came down across the Caucasian mountains and swept into Israel. It seems they swept down into Egypt before going back up and disappearing. Interesting, seen as Magog seems to be the land of the Scythians. And the Scythians were a warlike nation known for riding upon horses, of which we read in this chapter. And apparently their leader was called Gog, or either his name or his title. I'm unable to confirm whether or not this is correct, but if it is so, then Ezekiel would have had this as a backdrop. But primarily, primarily we know that this is a future prophecy, that Gog shall come down. And we know when he shall come down, for we are told it shall be in the latter days. Verse 8 tells us that it's in the latter years, in the time in which uh, he comes into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. And so it's in the latter years, in a time period in which Israel has returned to their land. And we see this again, except described slightly different. If we look a few verses down, and we see the expression, latter days. And so, we ask the question, when is the latter days? which you see in verse 16. This expression occurs many times throughout our Hebrew Bible. I've put just four of them upon the screen. If you look at them in the English, they may not be exactly the same, but I believe it's the same expression in the Hebrew. So, for example, Isaiah 2 speaks of the latter days, and it's in the context of there being a temple once again, in the context of the nations coming up and learning of God's law in the context of peace, when the nations beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
the context would seem to be the kingdom of God, yet future. Hosea 3 speaks also of the latter days. The context there seems to be when Israel shall seek God again. And the context also seems to imply that they once again have a king in Hosea 3. Daniel 10 speaks of the latter days in reference to the vision it's about to unfold. And we are then given Daniel chapter 11, this great momentous vision, which goes into Daniel 12 and speaks of the resurrection from the dead. And Daniel 2, of course, also speaks of the latter days and gives us the prophecy of the kingdom of men being destroyed and the kingdom of God being established in its place. And so the latter days would appear to be a time in which we know from other prophecies that Israel will, in the latter days, suffer evil, we are told, and yet also they will turn and seek God. The temple will be established, the kingdom of God shall be established, the nations shall learn of God's law, and there shall be peace. It is a time yet future to us, which we also see from our chapter when we look at verse 23, that the nations are going to sanctify God, it seems. And from the end of 39, when it speaks of the time when Israel should have been regathered, and the last verse, neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord Yahweh. And so we see that the time period is yet future. We also see this from comparing other scriptures like Zechariah 14, of which we haven't got time this evening to go through and make all the comparisons and see that these are speaking about the same events. And so, okay, it's going to occur in the future, but when? When exactly will this battle occur? Now, of course, we do not know. We can be very excited for just a few years ago, in 1948, the Jews returned to their land, which is required by this prophecy. As we see in verse 8, in 1967, they took back Jerusalem, and now we do see Jews upon the mountains of Israel. This region, which the world is... Uh, describes as the West Bank and often describes the settlement of the Jews as illegal. And you can go there and you can go to these settlements if you wish. You can go and see the Jews living there in the land in fulfillment of this prophecy. And yet, if you were to enter one of these settlements, you must pass through a very large gate. For the land of Israel is perhaps the antithesis of what we read here. If you were to choose one nation in the world that definitely doesn't fit with what we read here, dwelling safely, without walls and bars and gates, it would probably be Israel. They have a huge war which is still under construction because of all the terrorists. They have bars, they have gates, they are afraid. And yet, it is prophesied that this will change. If you were to go back a hundred years before 1948, around the time in which Alpha's Israel was written, in which John Thomas recognised the Jews would return to their land, how unlikely would that have seemed? If you looked at the world around you, how could that ever have been the case that the Jews would return to their land? And yet they did. And so we see and know that this prophecy shall be fulfilled. That surely God has prophesied it, and therefore it shall come to pass. The Jews will come to the point in which they actually do think they have true peace and safety. And yet, of course, this turns out to be false. If we have a quick look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we seem to have a commentary upon this. For the end of, uh, the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read of the resurrection of the dead. We read of those being raised and those that are still alive at the coming of the Lord being taken away to be with the Lord Jesus Christ that they might ever be with the Lord, and they might admire their Lord. And then chapter 5 says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Interesting, it says they shall say peace and safety. Because, of course, although they think at this time it appears to the nations and to the Jews that the, at last there is peace and safety, 
This shall not be the case, because of course Go will come down. It's interesting that in the context of when will the Lord return, uh, we read of the times and the seasons, and then in verse 3 we're presented with this peace and safety. This may be implying to us that this is the last sign we will see before being taken away, the peace and the safety. And yet this may not be the case. As far as I'm aware, there is no definite prophecy that still needs to be fulfilled before the time of our taking away to judgment, before the time the responsible shall appear before the judge. The scene is clearly not quite yet set for Armageddon, for there is no peace and safety yet in the land. But it may be that we are taken away years before Armageddon occurs, perhaps ten years before this battle occurs. For as we thought about at the beginning, as we know from Zechariah 14, the saints are going to be there with Christ when they come into the land to save Israel. And so we must be taken away before that takes place. And so although this, may not, this battle may not have its scene quite set correctly yet, that does not mean that we cannot be taken away this day, or indeed we may even die this day. And yet we do see everything falling into place. We see the Jews back in their land. We see the confederacies coming together. We see Britain separating from Europe. And we know that we know the end picture. We just don't know how we're going to get there. But as a general theme, we see everything slowly coming together. And occasionally something goes backwards, like when Britain joined the EU. And yet, then it suddenly comes forward again when they leave. And so everything's trending towards this final picture, which will play out upon the world scene in that day that God has appointed. So let's move to our final question of how will it end? So we haven't yet uh, touched upon the last few verses of this chapter. For verse 18 tells us that at the time when Go comes against the land of Israel, the Lord Yahweh saith, My fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven, the beasts of the field, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth, shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. There's going to be a momentous earthquake. We link this with Zechariah 14 and the Mount of Olives splitting. We see in the context of the land of Israel that every wall shall fall to the ground. And presumably, if every wall in Israel is going to fall to the ground, if the Mount of Olives is going to split, this may indeed even have a worldwide implication on the rest of the world. And we know for sure that judgments shall take place worldwide. The language here seems to take us back to Genesis chapter 1. The fish of the sea, the fowl of the heaven, the beasts of the field, the things that creep upon the earth, the men. It seems to even be basically the same order as we read in Genesis chapter 1. Perhaps this is reminding us of the momentous occasion of these events. For if we look at Hebrews 12 and verse 27, in Hebrews 12 we read two of a shaking. So Hebrews 12 going in at verse 26, which says, Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of those things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. And uh, if you note how it says at the end of verse 26, shaking both the heaven and the earth, well, Joel 3, which is a parallel account to Ezekiel, in verse 16, says specifically the earth and the heaven shall shake. It seems to perhaps be speaking symbolically there. For this great earthquake in Ezekiel is perhaps the... Uh, beginning of the great earthquake at the end of Revelation 16. The great judgments that have come upon the earth will shake the heaven and the earth. They will destroy the kingdom of men, and that the kingdom of God, which cannot be shaken, shall remain. And so if we come across to Peter, in 2 Peter 3 and verse 13, we read, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, 
wherein dwelleth righteousness. Hence our link to creation. For as we think of all those things created in Genesis 1 being shaken, we know this is the beginning of the outpourings of the judgment of God, which will result in the new heavens and the new earth, wherein shall dwell righteousness, a kingdom being established that cannot be shaken. And so Ezekiel 38 goes on in verse 21 to say, I will call for a sword against him, that is Gog, throughout all my mountains. Saith the Lord Yahweh, every man's sword shall be against his brother. This too we read of in Zechariah 14 and verse 13, or it's also in Habakkuk 3, that in the confusion goes army, they shall turn upon themselves. Also verse 22, and I'll plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I'll rain upon him and upon his bands, and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain, and great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. This links us to that great battle that is described in Revelation chapter 20, of which we do not have time to go into. And it's interesting just to note that a short space before the establishment of the thousand years kingdom of God, Gog of the land of Mago comes against Israel and is destroyed by God. And in the symmetry of God's purpose, a short space, even a little season after the thousand years, Gog and Magog, we are told, shall once again, as it were, come against the land of Israel, and they shall be destroyed by God, by a fire out of heaven. And so Ezekiel 38, verse 23, Thus will I magnify myself, and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. And so we see, and these great judgments, which will devastate Gog's army, and shall save the people of Israel and to sanctify the Lord God. So we've considered who's involved in seeing this great confederacy of nations. We've seen why this is going to take place, that it is God who is in control, although Gog thinks he is taking a spoil. We've thought of when this shall happen and seen it is yet to take place, perhaps very shortly, and we of course hope to be there in that day, among those saints that shall, that shall come with the Lord Jesus. For we know it shall end with God being victorious, with the nations being defeated, and the kingdom of Israel being restored, the kingdom of God there being established in the land of Israel, ready over the next few years, as the stone of Daniel chapter 2, to spread and fill the entire land, that the kingdom of God may encompass the whole earth, and that truly the earth then will begin to be filled with the glory of God, and the knowledge of his glory, even as the waters that cover the sea.